I've told people for years, if, if you ever want to meet the most important people in the world, you need to come spend a day at the tea shop. Because every person that walks in that door with a problem is more important than everybody else that was there before them. <laughs> It'll be 58 years in July that I've been fixing shoes. I put my first pair of heels on in 1960 when I was six years old. They stuck uh, two, the old wooden Dr. Pepper crates, they stuck two of those crates on top of each other and I climbed on them and put a pair of heels on a pair of cowboy boots, 1960. And it's kind of funny, people will surprise you and people will amaze you. So. Some people you think are uh, really nice, good, decent people. Uh, if they don't get their way, uh, they're not so nice. Anyway, that's and then and and just the opposite. People you think uh, uh, you wouldn't expect will go out of their way to uh, uh, to convenience me versus me conveniencing them. You know, they'll bring something in and not put any pressure on me. And, uh, just do it when you can, you know, let it go. When it's ready, it'll be ready. No, no pressure, no problem, no demands. I've been through a lot of tragedies, but uh, how, how I react, how we react, how people react, really determines how your life goes. That was. My mother told me when I was 27 years old, life has nothing to do with what happens. It's all about how you react to it. And uh, that didn't used to mean much to me, but every day it means more than it did the day before because it's, uh, it, it's dealing with life that really determines your life. I had a normal life, I, I, the older I get, the more I realize what I, I, I had a very good race and my parents were wonderful people, God-fearing Christians. Uh, my dad worked hard, my mother raised nine kids, you can believe that, yes, I'm the seventh of nine children. So you have to have some that are easily obtainable, some of them you really have to strive to get, and then some that are impossible to reach, but you continue to strive for. That's a project that's been hanging there for about a year. And I hadn't got to them yet, but I haven't given up on them yet. I remember, the, probably the first memory, I was trying to think of the first time that I could ever remember praying. And I remember being like four years old, and my mom was at a friend's house, and her, the friend had a husband there, and they were all drunk. And it was a bunch of us kids there, and we were in a bedroom right off the kitchen. And anyway, they were drinking, and they started fighting and yelling and screaming. And I don't think I knew anything about praying, but these kids that were there did. My sister was one of them, but they all said, hey, let's pray. Let's just get down on our knees right now. <laughs> let's just pray. I was like, hey, tell me about this. You know, I want to know more, you know. And so we all did pray and everything, and then I just was curious at that point. Um, just to know, you know, okay, we have a God and we can pray and he'll help us. You know, this is good news. You know, why haven't I heard of this? I wanted to get out of my house because, you know, I mean, it's just chaotic. So I decided I was going to graduate a year early in high school. And like I told my parents that, and they were like, you won't be able to, you'll probably just don't even try. But I didn't listen to them. That kind of motivated me to show them, yes, I can do this. So I did it and I graduated a year early. Instead of going to college, I got married and um, had two kids back to back, you know, when I was very young. I had my son when I was 18. Um, I had my daughter when I was 20. I was working, my husband was going to college, and we were planning on when he got done that I would go. But um, he ended up passing away from complications with diabetes because he didn't take care of himself for a while. We had moved to Little Rock while he was going to school, and I was working. 
And then when he passed away, I moved back down south where my parents were and his parents were so I could have some help because I didn't want to be all alone in a city with no one. And um, I stayed there for about a year and just got all the help I could get with the kids. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I knew I needed to do something or I was going to stay the same. Like I wanted to move forward, you know. And um, so I decided I was going to go to college. And I really didn't know what I was going to go to college for, but I was just going to go. I applied at Pulaski Tech in Little Rock. And um, you had to go take a test, like a compass test or something to get in. And I, ch I chickened out. And I was like, never mind. I don't want to. You know, change is scary. You know, I don't want to do this. But I ended up, someone told me, just go do it, you know. And so I went, and I got in, and then I moved my kids to Sheridan, which was close to Little Rock, but I knew someone there that could help me if I was in a struggle, you know. And so I went to college, and my first degree was like computer-aided drafting. For some reason, I didn't really research any of this stuff, and I just thought I was going to be like an architect or something, you know. And so a year into the program, I realized, like, no, you're not going to be an architect. So. I went ahead and finished the program because something instilled in me, I don't know where, but whatever you start, you need to finish, like, you got to, you can't be a quitter, you know, and so I got through that, and then I decided I wanted to be um, a dental hygienist, and also I didn't research that very well, I don't know if we had Google back then, so I um, went to dental assisting school, and that's not saying that, so <laughs> when I finished that, I realized that I wanted to be a dental hygienist, so I went started taking classes towards being able to apply like the prerequisite classes. I applied and I got an interview with UAMS. I was so excited and then I didn't make it after I went to that interview. I didn't get picked. And so I was kind of crushed and I thought you still got to do something. You got to take care of these kids and you know you got you got to make a future for them. And besides they said like statistically that if you go to college your kids will and I just wanted the best for my kids. I applied to ultrasound school and x-ray school the next year. I took some more classes in between to do that and I got into x-ray school. So that was like yes, you know finally I'm gonna do something. Before I went to UAMS I had gotten involved with a man from high school and we had like reconnected and I thought okay he's probably the one, he was not the one. But in the meantime we had a child together so now I have three kids and I'm single mom because he turned out to be narcissistic and controlling and verbally abusive and all these things and I had to run. He started to make my life miserable every year. It wasn't constant because he was in another state but I mean it was all the things, the threats, the scariness, you know all these things. I dealt with him forever, but last year we went to court and I don't have to deal with him anymore because they finally gave me a no contact order, so I don't have to worry about that. And I got married three years ago, and my husband had six children, and I had three children, so we had nine. And then we had two surprise babies in the meantime, so now we have 11 kids. Let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six at home. We have six at home. And um, the rest, two on the weekend, so that's eight, and then three are grown, excuse me. Really, two of them that live at home are grown, too. They just still live at home. But anyway, we have 11 kids all together, and I decided last year that I wanted to get a master's degree, so I started going back to school. I'm still, you know, working here, but I go online to get a master's degree. I'm hoping that that will put me in another field that I can make more money, you know, than what I do now. You know, I'm a I'm a amateur photographer. I've uh, in the last six or seven years, I've taken like 800,000 pictures. I didn't have my awakening until I was 48 years old. My 23-month-old granddaughter was beat to death by her daddy. He was a drug addict, and uh, I have very good reason to hate drug addicts, but I hate the drug. I used to hate him.
the, probably the turning point in my life is when I finally forgave him. And it took me five years from the time my daughter, granddaughter died. Five years later, I forgave him. He committed suicide a week after he murdered her. So I was hating a dead man for five years of my life, wondering, you know, how, you know, how crazy is that? Uh, but I, when I forgave him, I started getting better and uh, stumbled into a uh, sober recovery meeting and uh, thought I was going to help him lead it. And basically when I got there, uh, I got out of denial and realized what a horrible mess I was in. My name's Don Pennington. I'm a Celebrate Recovery Ministry Leader at New Life Church in Russellville, Arkansas. And probably the one thing I say more than anything else is that God can't fix what you say ain't broke. And the bottom line on that is that most of us have secrets that we think are our secrets. And the fact is, just about everybody knows them except us. We're just the ones that won't admit them. Uh, getting into recovery and acknowledging that you do have a problem, because uh, not John Baker, but Rick Warren, the pastor for Saddleback Church, says there are two kinds of people in this world. People that know they need recovery and people that don't, because all of them need recovery. After, you know, after my granddaughter was murdered, her dad committed suicide. And like I said, I spent five years wanting to kill him, and he was already dead. I spent five years of my life, basically, I'd go to work and I'd go home and I'd drink till I passed out. And I, I did that every day. And I'm really not an alcoholic. I'm not a, a, one of our token drinking problem people. It was just something I did. The next year I had a brother die, and right after him another brother died. Both of them were in their early 50s. Both of them died of heart attacks. And then my best, one of my best friends, best friend I probably ever had, died of early onset Alzheimer's. And between those three, my brother, my best friend, and my other brother, there were 51, 52, and 53. That's pretty young. When you, when you get older, you'll realize that's really young. After that, my, uh, my, I had three daughters. My middle daughter, the mother of the child that was murdered, uh, she fell apart from day one. She ended up in prison. And uh, my wife and I, my marriage fell apart. My, my wife and I separated. She called me December 2006. I hadn't talked to her in a year, and she said she was sick. Well, in January, she found out that she was stage four non-small cell carcinoma lung cancer, and uh, that uh, they're, it was way too far, way too far gone. We'd gotten my daughter out of prison to, to visit her and see her uh, in January of 2007, so they, they got to spend some time together. and. Uh, and between then, she passed away in April of 2007. Three weeks later, my daughter got killed in a car wreck. That was hard. And that was pretty much the last straw for me. I was, you know, there wasn't much left of me. I was planning my suicide. You know, life is not about your friends. It's about how you deal with your enemies. And I, I never really thought about it that way. But it, it's easy to have a good relationship with someone that's a friend of yours. But uh, to uh, if you've got someone that you consider or classify as an enemy, uh, you dwell on it. You, you have expectations. You have demands. You think they're supposed to be a certain way. And you end up spending way too much of your time working on that as opposed to living your own life. And uh, it's uh, trying to get out of the negative back into the positive. That, uh, that was probably the biggest change in my life is when I forgave the guy that murdered my granddaughter. 
and it, it was uh, I had enough hair on the mountain, but it was probably one of the very worst days and one of the very best days in my life. In the same few moments, it's just uh, I knew I had to forgive him if I wanted to keep living, and uh, uh, that was the last thing I wanted to do was forgive him. And I think I told you he'd been dead for five years the day I forgave him, and uh, it was uh, it was life changing. It made such a difference in my life, and, and I work on forgiveness probably as much or more than I do anything else in my life, and. Uh, it's a, it's a key. It's a, it's a major key in uh, surviving. A very dear friend of mine didn't know nothing about it, but she, uh, she talked me into instead of building a memorial guard, garden for my granddaughter, and I built, a, we built one out in my backyard with a whole bunch of different things on it, but uh, uh, that project kept me alive. And uh, if that person hadn't shown up and stepped in right at that moment, it'd probably never happened. Every time I've turned around through all the crises in my life, somebody always stepped in and I began to look at them as people hosting angels. It's funny, all the stuff I get, people bring stuff in all the time, and some of it looks like a real easy fix. And when you get into it, it's uh, just broken all the pieces inside. And if it looks good on the outside, people think it's easy to take care of. And uh, I guess that's why I don't like secrets so much about people, because when you've got things on the inside that nobody knows about, uh, it might look like things are good or well, but they're not. And I've had some of the worst looking shoes that turned out really good because on the inside they were fixable. And then I've had stuff that looked like it was really good that I couldn't do anything with because once you got inside there, it was a mess. And that's people are like that. I've, uh, I've seen a lot of people that uh, their outward appearance doesn't look like much, but when you get to actually get to know them, there's a, a major difference in what you think you see when you're looking with your eyes versus looking with your heart. If that makes any sense. Normal people did abnormal things, or I think there's a, a ordinary people do extraordinary things. And it always came back to me that, and during most of my crises, somebody always stepped up and did something. And then I talked to them about it later, and they never had a clue. They said, I didn't do anything. And, yeah, you saved my life. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm beginning to think not everybody has that blessing because I've always got somebody that's always shown up at the most critical moment. And it always uh, made things better. So I can't take the credit for being an overcomer, but uh, I, I'm finally realizing where it comes from, and it comes from other people that really care. This lady brought these boots in one time, and uh, Nasty, nasty, nasty. It was like they'd been in the cow lot in the rain and the mud. The whole time they had the boots, you couldn't even tell what brand of boot it was. They were just so, so bad. And I scrubbed and cleaned and scrubbed and cleaned. And uh, it took me a couple of days. I had to scrub them down good and let them dry. And basically that just perked the dirt out of what was deep inside there. And that's kind of like working with people sometimes. Uh, 
it takes a while for things to surface. And, but I worked on these boots and I'd let them set, and then I worked on them and I let them set. And when I got done and actually got down to the leather and had gotten all of the stuff that was so in, embedded into there, uh, Clinton, Clinton, I think it's Clint Coon. He's a national, nationally known bull rider. He's from Arkansas. But his autograph was on the top of the boot. But, you know, uh, uh, it's just like you know, dealing with issues sometimes. If you've got people with problems and you keep, uh, that's what I was doing with me. I, keep, I kept cleaning on myself, you know, kept working on it and working on it. And when I finally got all the crap out, there was something pretty cool down in there.